Well, all right. Uh, all right. Well, here we are, sitting in the in the law office, and uh, Habitat has given that to the Fuller Center. So we are mm -hmm. delighted mm -hmm. to be able to preserve this piece of Absolutely. history. Absolutely, I am so delighted too. There are um, special times that happen here, and it's starting with the renovation, which I was in charge of. This was when, about 1977? <clears throat> yes, the spring of 77. And you bought the house for $4,000. Yeah, um, we had wondered what we were going to do because it wasn't working out to stay at Cornelia and Miller couldn't really practice law out there and also we wanted to start Habitat for Man, international uh, organization and Cornelia was more inclined to just work here in America. So we knew that we needed to kind of shift gears and also the schools weren't very good in the county, separate system at that time, city and county. So we we felt God really saying, you know, you just need to move into America, but we had such little money uh, coming home off of the missionary field. Yep. And um, so we had known uh, Jim and Sheila Jackson. They had actually lived at Koinonia for a while. They were fired from a church in Andalusia because of some black visitors they had that he made welcome. And they made a quick move to Koinonia, uh, had a, um, uh, a mobile home out there and then wanted to have more ministry here in town and bought this house. I'm not sure what they paid for it, but they, uh, their family lived here for quite a while and then they wanted to, to move uh, somewhere else. So um, Miller said, well, we're looking for a, an office where I want to do my law practice and I want to have an office for Habitat for Humanity. So uh, Miller would ask him, what would you sell your house to us for <clears throat> and he said four thousand dollars well that was back in 1977 the thing about the house was um, there was a old front porch and it was basically falling down and we knew we'd have to do something about that but four thousand dollars that was that was a good deal we were able to make uh, agree on that so um, it, it just basically needed some work. Millard found one of the guys that had worked with us in Zaire. Right. Uh, he was an architect in Atlanta and he asked him to draw up a design to do some brickwork, you know, make it look nice yeah. from the outside. And we found a local brick maker, a uh, brick, brick um, layer here, Paul Prescott. And that work started Whereas I started doing some renovation on the inside. All the paneling on the walls is original. The floors were pretty much threadbare and I knew that I would have to find some inexpensive carpet. And the bricklayer, Paul Prescott, he knew of a, a, a place over in Columbus that was a carpet uh, warehouse kind of we I said well you know all we have is a an old Ford how would I ever get the carpet over here he said well I'll take you over there in my truck there you go yeah so we found a great big old roll of gold shag carpet you know <laughs> that was more than enough to to put down shag park carpet was a little bit more popular it was, it was now. and the price was right um I don't know how much painting I did. I may have, we may have painted the woodwork. I think we needed to do that. Um, I understand there was an good. old kitchen in the back that was in a mess. The bathroom was just pretty awful, so that had to be fixed mm. up. We had to have curtains and typewriters and desks. And so we were able to find pretty much everything at a used furniture store, except for the conference table and the chairs we're sitting in here with the sofa to match. 
Clive Rainey, who was our first Habitat volunteer, knew about auction in Dawson. He took me down there one evening and we found this, this nice set because we needed kind of a nice place for law clients to sit. And then we found a, an old dining room table. It, it didn't even have chairs, so that was kind of perfect. We, uh, <clears throat> we bought the dining room table. And uh, I was getting ready to tell you about the curtains. Now, I'd heard of people making curtains out of bed sheets. And that was the easiest, least expensive thing I could do. I had a pair of drapes left over from the house that we left in Montgomery, some drapes that were made of uh, very high quality antique satin. For some reason, I had saved them and they, they were perfect for the what we call the law library, and for Millard's office, he gave us a little class. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the law books were most of them were a gift from a retiring district attorney, who uh, Millard made good friends with. We didn't have any, many friends back <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, we were. Uh, pretty much outcast because of moving in town from Koinonia. But he gave Miller all of his law books, which was a big help. Well, where are we going to put them? <laughs> well, we knew that we were going to have to have some shelving. And so, um, as it turned out, just about the time that I was needing to put them up, a whole big group of Hutterites came. And I said, can you stay a few days and help me put up some shelving? And they did, and that was wonderful. Oh, yeah. the, the and they did a good job. Out. Those are heavy books, and those mm -hmm. shelves are solid. Oh, yeah, they certainly are. The biggest challenge that I had with this building was with the front door. It's a beautiful door. Uh, it, paint was all flaking off of it, you know, I said, well, I've got to do something with this door. I figured there'd be some pretty wood underneath. I got some paint stripper. I started rubbing and rubbing and rubbing, and I found more and more and more layers of paint. And I said, this is going to just take me forever. So I, I kept getting stronger and stronger chemicals. I still wasn't, you know, getting it down to the wood. Finally, somebody suggested that I use Red Devil's Lye. Right. It was a liquid. Yeah. Mm. And I, t I don't know if I took that door down or somebody helped me, but I put it right out here in the yard. I rubbed that Red Devil's Lye on there, and man, did that paint start coming up and curling. Whoa, I was just amazed. In fact, I noticed that the wood was even becoming roughed up. So I said, I better get this off of here right now. <clears throat> or it eats up the door. I turned the hose on it. I should have had high rubber boots. The water soaked into my shoes and put my feet on fire. <laughs> I got out of those shoes real quick, but eventually I learned how to use it, you know, without burning myself Damage up. Yourself. Yeah, and it stripped all the, the paint off, and then all I did was just put some, like, uh, lemon oil or something like that. Yeah. Natural wood. Yeah. yeah, I was real proud of that. There was a bail on that. I don't know if the I bail is still this on bell's there. The still there. I don't know if really? it works or not. All you did was just, like, click this little wire and turn it loose. Bing! You well, know? We'll have to look at it because I saw uh, it was sitting there. Okay. And, uh, well, I guess the bell's still there. Yeah, the unit's mm -hmm. there. We'll see if it works. No, I guess that was the biggest challenge of all. Well, a fine job you did. Oh, but the place is good. great and um, pretty much unchanged. Like the typewriters, were these the ones that were here? Or? No. When they wanted to turn this back into a museum, sort of like the way it was when we started Habitat and had the law office. I had to go uh, hunt some old antique old typewriters. 
So they're similar to what you They're mean. similar, yeah. yeah, the whole style. And the other thing that's different is both Miller and myself had two phones, two, two what, you know, landlines yeah. that we don't have much anymore uh, on our each of our desks. One was rang the habitat number and one rang the law well, office number. I think they're, they're still here. And you had to remember which was which, you know, you continually. Uh, well, Fuller's Law Office or Habitat for Humanity. <laughs> so how long did the, did, uh, shortly after that then you bought the house next door? Yes. And yes. moved the head, Habitat headquarters over y there. Yes, that property became available and it was the house which was a one-story house. Right. Later we found out that it had originally been a two-story house and a former mayor of America's. That had been his home. But the property included the house on the corner and the one behind it. Oh, okay. And uh, we renovated, renovated that. Millard and I moved our offices over there. As I recall, Millard had his office upstairs, and I had, I was downstairs with the, the secretary pool. We had about maybe ten secretaries because we were having to file all the the people on the mailing list. Everybody was on a card. Mm -hmm. We had these great big stacks of metal file cabinets that we kept our mailing list in. Um, but I was concerned. I knew that there were going to be about eight or ten desks in that room. I was concerned that it was going to be too noisy. And we put carpet on one wall. One of the long walls we put carpet right. on to absorb oh, for that sound. noise. Yeah. Um, how long did the law office then stay open as the law office? Um, I guess when we moved over there, the law business was picking up as well as Habitat for Humanity. And <clears throat> that's when, when Millard ran an ad in a law magazine uh, asking for someone to come and help with that. So um, um, Tom McFarland came down from Atlanta, an Emory law student, law graduate. And when Millard moved over there, he didn't see very many law clients. It was pretty much Tom McFarland that took that over. And Millard began more travel, speaking, and developing Habitat for Humanity. Right. right. So Tom stayed here then for a while. Yes. And um, kept this going. Yes. And then at some point, I guess he went off on his own. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, well, not to practice law. As it turned out, he really didn't care much for practicing oh. law. <laughs> he wanted to do other kind of volunteer and yeah. mission work around the community. I think that he had a regular job, um, a paying job. I don't know if it was the, with the unemployment office. I can't recall right now. He's retired from that as well. Yeah. But um, yes, he he really filled a a very important spot to yeah. free Millard up. Millard um, had a very good friend who was a lawyer in Columbus, Ken Henson, and Ken was a lot into. Um, um, I can't remember what it is. When somebody has an accident, personal injury. Oh, okay. He was at big time into personal injury cases. And those pretty lucrative right. cases. So Ken and Millard have an agreement that if you'll do all the research and all the depositions and all of that, you can brief me right before it goes to trial and I'll you know, I'll be the leading attorney. And that worked real well. That was a good partnership yeah. there. That's, Millard really loved to do that. He was excellent in the courtroom. And um, <laughs> there's a lot, that, that's a lot of stories right there in right itself. <laughs> Miller's, yeah. Miller's law practice. Now is this the same Ken Henson? Or is it that we worked with to set up the floor center? Yes, okay. yes. Ken Eventually, he grew more and more interested in Habitat and helped start the 
Habitat project in Columbus. Yeah, and he's been a big, big supporter. Yes, of that he had. Through the years. Yeah, I guess he was on the Fuller Center <coughs> board for a while. Well, right? he was one of our founder, the four founders, you and Millard and Ken and I. Yeah, that's right. He so was he, on the papers we filed. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Forgotten yeah. about that. Yeah. But he didn't come over here. No, no. Miller just did the, the court work for him. That's yeah. pretty clever, actually. Yeah. What a great uh -huh. deal. Also, Miller really enjoyed uh, death penalty cases. Yeah. He was so persuasive of the jury, and he felt so strongly that the death penalty was, was wrong, huh. that he, could, he was very passionate about that. And there were several uh, extremely um, difficult cases that he got involved with. And a number of times uh, they saved people, saved people in his life. Yeah. They may have gotten a lifetime sentence, but at least. I remember one particular case. Um, there was a guy on death row. He had been part of the security at the White House. Um, he was in the military. He, he didn't do anything wrong there, but when he uh, when his tour of duty was over, he went back home, somewhere in Georgia, here in Georgia, I've forgotten where they were from. And his cousin talked him into robbing their uncle and setting the house on fire. He just kind of went along with it, and the uncle died in that fire, and so he, he, went, he went to prison. And so um, that was one of the major cases that I remember huh. Miller working on. So when did Miller pretty much have to give up the law practice? I can't remember the exact year. Mm, when we uh, built Habitat, New ha Habitat headquarters down here on uh, Miller Fuller, what is now Miller Fuller, Miller Fuller Boulevard, Boulevard right. and West Church Street. Uh, he was still trying cases with Ken Henson. That would have been in the late 80s. Um, and it's gee whiz, I'm thinking in the 90s sometime. He just said, you know, Habitat's growing too fast. I just can't do it anymore. Right, right. Well, um, Clive told me in a note that uh, Millard actually had, they visited about this and Millard was trying to decide if he should keep defending the death penalty cases or he should mm -hmm. do the habitat. Mm -hmm. So did he want to work with the condemned or did he want to work with the hopeful? <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's right. That was, that was, that yeah, was, that was kind of a crossroads right there. Yeah, yeah. So a couple things. One, um, you moved in here in 77. But then you actually bought that property like in 78. Mm -hmm. So the habitat was it had its its nursery here, yes. but it, it, it really grew up across the, mm -hmm. the driveway. You know, I think um, when we did our first walk in 1983, which would have been basically five or six years after we started Habitat, I can remember we were already working over there. I can't exactly remember the year, but if I had to guess, I would say we were here a couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was a day like? Just a typical day? <laughs> okay. Or was there such a thing? Well, I remember, uh, you know, uh, if I could just back up just a little bit, when we bought this house, then we said, okay, well, we're really going to... We're really going to make America the center of operation. We've got to have a place to live. So I started looking for houses. Oh, you didn't have. And cities. about the only way you could do that was to we'll look at the classified, you know, houses this for thing. sale. And um, I looked at a few. Then I saw this ad for a house and a half, one and a half houses. I thought, what is that? One and a half houses? And I had a realtor show show me the house um, and and the half was a, a finished attic that's what it was oh that was the half that was a half <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was a bath and two bedrooms and so you know it was a pretty big house 
in kind of bad shape. I think uh, some students at the college have been living there. I remember the, the kitchen was dark olive green. Um, the living room was, was dark red. Also, the bathroom upstairs was dark red. It was just, and there was uh, one of these mirrors. Well, we've got one here. The popular thing to do then was to buy squares of mirror yeah. <laughs> and glue it on the wall. Well, we had one over the fireplace. It was just uh, kind of a mess, but um, and it was there had it was a, a converted coal furnace uh, that it that had been converted into a, a gas floor furnace. We had actually Clive was in the painting business. That was actually how he was learn, er, earning a living, and <clears throat> we asked him to paint inside of our house. Well, I got this frantic call. One time, Linda, Linda, your house is on fire. I said, well, you're there, aren't you? He said, yeah, yeah, I put one of the drop cloths down on the furnace, the register, floor register, and it caught fire, and now everything's on fire. He said, come, come quick, I've already okay. called the fire department. Well, they had gotten it out pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> he was so embarrassed about that. Okay, getting back to your question, as I said, I spent. Well, let me ask first. That's the church, up, the house up here on the other end of Church Street. Yes, that's right, East Church. Street. Okay, it's, it's about been painted eight, eight blocks. It? Has it? Finally, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I thought it was, it was just going to fall. Mess. Mess. Okay. Okay, go ahead. A typical right. day. <laughs> yeah, so we found this house about eight blocks down, which really turned about turned out to be handy because we only had one car and our kids needed the car to go to school and stuff. So Miller and I walked. Uh, back and forth here and for the first three months when I was working on renovating this this office I was wearing you know like grubby clothes just old stuff and this messy messy clothes and when it came time to actually open up the office and I was going to be working a desk I realized I didn't have I didn't have anything to wear. <laughs> we had just come back from Africa. Yep. I left whatever clothes I had over there for people to have, and all I needed at Cornelia was just jeans and t-shirts and stuff. I had to go out and buy myself a dress, <laughs> and we didn't have any much money, so I wore, I remember I wore the same dress every day. I thought, this is good because I don't have to think of what to wear. I just, it was like a uniform. And it was, the call, I must have been crazy about apple, uh, Granny Smith apple green because that's the color we painted our house. That's the color of my dress. I can still remember what that dress looked like. But um, a typical day was, um, Getting the kids off to school and coming here, and like I said, we had one phone for our habitat, one phone for the law office. We had we didn't have very many clients at, at the beginning, but it was kind of awkward when I would sit here and I would need to to type, and all the people were sitting here waiting, you know. But um, sometimes I would be t typing a legal document. Sometimes I'd be typing letters. We were doing a newsletter for Habitat. I think probably every six to six weeks to two months. And we had one of these presses. Yeah. The ink. Like the mimeograph ink machine. The mimeograph machine. Yeah. And so Millard would write the letter. I would get in pictures that showed what we were doing. We were just basically telling people what was still happening back in Congo, mm -hmm. Zaire, and any efforts that got started here in, in uh, the United States, like Austin, Texas, Mokalee, Florida, up in uh, Appalachia, um, and whatever, whatever we did, I'd, I'd make sure that I had a picture to show. That's kind of the way our newsletter was at Quantity. And a few pictures. So I would have to figure out how to manually type the, the newsletter and leave room for pictures 
it was just a very complicated pro process and would get ink all over me. Um, and then we had some volunteers that would fold them, stamp them, address them. All over. Mostly I was just typing and answering the phone and welcoming any law clients that came in. We had a few visitors too with yeah. that tech. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was um, wonderful that uh, Millard and I could work side by side. And when we were in Africa, we had one room designated as a, 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 a an office, a desk, and one typewriter. <clears throat> so it was nice that I didn't need to share my typewriter. I <laughs> Uh, it was just great having it as a mom and pop yeah. Yeah. operation. Two of you together. Yeah, two of us Making, together. Not realizing you were making history. Yeah. No, no, but um, I had an inkling that of Millard's vast success in business and the way he was pushing, pushing as he always did, that it, it was going to grow pretty fast. The faster it grew, the harder I had to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to get some other people right. to come in and help. Well, we're going to try to keep this as sort of a uh, museum of affordable housing work and the work that you and Miller did to make it all possible.